and we're live. It is Wednesday, November 10th, 2021, 5.01 p.m., 4.01 p.m. in Wisconsin. Uh, is it is it getting dark there already? Or Yes, it's getting, it's getting dark right now. It's pitch black here. No, yeah. I'm pitch. And, and by the way, but... thanks for having that picture of me from like 20 years ago when I still had like thick hair and it was... Oh, I was actually going to say how great your hair looked today. I actually noticed that. I was like, did you have a haircut or something? I was actually going to say something. It looks today. So anyways. Yeah. Okay. No. Uh, but apparently. Just, yeah. Well, some weeks ago. You know, I, I um, I, I, let's put it this way. You are not uh, the person who, with our choice of picture, we have endeavored most to embarrass. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Okay. And uh, I would just, it was just kind of a flashback to a, you know, different era. Yeah, um, but- uh, We're not allowed to have fun anymore. We are not allowed to have there's fun no, anymore. No We're fun. still not allowed to have fun anymore. We are allowed to have Charlie Sykes from a different time zone, from a latitude north of here. Um, Charlie, yeah. uh, how are you feeling? <laughs> how are, how are how are your humors, Charlie? Like, oh, you know, I woke up today feeling exhausted. I actually had uh, Dana Milbank on my podcast, and I said, "Dana, do you ever just get exhausted by all the shit and everything?" I was feeling that way. I don't yeah. know how you guys do. The yeah, I don't know how you like do politics and like don't just develop like a case of existentialism that like is not treatable with any antibiotics or or ivermectin or like any or, or <laughs> antidepressants <laughs> for that yeah. matter. Yeah. That's uh, why I have dogs. I That's I, 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 have, I, have, I think I, I know I think I know I think I know the, the answer in Charlie's no? case. Yeah. Well, which is, is that Charlie's podcast has turned in and it, as I say every time Charlie is on the show, I say this it's the only podcast I listen to every day. You used to listen to the gist. Well, the the only the, the the other one there were two. The other one was Mike Pesca's, uh, which I'm assured will be back at some yeah. point. But uh, right now, there's only one. And the thing is about it is that it has evolved over the years into the chronicle of the destruction of conservatism, and it's kind of the a daily meditation, sometimes humorous, sometimes uh, despairing. With despairing sometimes um uh 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 hopeful about the other side sometimes despairing about the other side but it is basically a diarist of the destruction of a movement no i i kind of feel that way be, doing it every day you have to have a discussion of it and you know you can kind of rethink things but, but thank you I, I i appreciate that sounds, that. that sounds incredibly optimistic would you have said that a couple of months ago about the podcast oh yeah I've, in fact i think i said that the less the last time charlie was on the show oh, that it, was, remember a, that. That it no. was a kind of chronicle of uh and a, and the thing is you're vamping off of different events every day that right. because but it's a it's there is this larger theme, which is how did this movement that I was a part of become uh, the rantings of a bunch of crazy people? And I thought your recent comments, including yesterday about Dennis Prager, are interesting examples of that, that, you know, this is somebody who and part of what makes it work is that you're candid enough to say, hey, wait a minute, this is somebody who I used to see as yeah. a like a somebody who I was roughly philosophically in tune with, and now he's a deranged, crazy person. Um, and, you know, there's no effort to run away from, uh, you know, like well, I, I, I have this. Well, I mean, I have this with Jonathan. No place Turner, to hide. You know, <laughs> so. I can't, I can't, you know, he, he has developed conspiracy <laughs> theories about the Brookings Institution and me. It's like, I'm, I'm at least a little bit responsible for his prominence, I'm afraid. Um, Can I ask a question very quickly that I think is kind of, would be an interesting conversation to have, too, maybe a little bit? It's like, I'm interested when Ben says that, um, that you have these philosophical commonalities with people. In hindsight, 
is it that you don't is that you think that you shared do you think that you were wrong about the individual and the principles that they held and you imbued too much to their principles from their like surface level politics or do you think that or do you think that the politics moved or both well, it depends who you're talking about. I mean, that, that's what makes this so difficult. You know, it, it is this rolling, this rolling process of, of asking those kinds of questions. So, OK, so Dennis Prager is in a, sort of a different class because he was once a very serious thinker. I mean, he wrote. Was he really? Like, I about, actually didn't yes, know that. About okay. ethics. He's a Jewish ethicist who wrote about things like happiness, a very serious individual. His radio talk show was, if, if, if Rush Limbaugh is sort of over here, he was a much more sort of thoughtful kind of guy. And to watch him now is like, okay, what happened to you? Because you were a serious guy. It's a little bit like uh, Eric Metaxas watch, watching him. You know, here's a guy that wrote a book or on Peter Bonhoff. Can I also exactly. ask like, why is this not the, true of all people in our lives besides just these individuals? Like, why is this not true about your relationship with your brother or like your parents like maybe everyone changes or everyone isn't who yeah. they thought they were sorry that's also just like as a total like not to go total big picture on it but just kind of i'm just like sitting here thinking about that like well that's particularly difficult for me you know puzzling because as an only child i don't have to deal with the issues of the the crazy brothers and things like that but no i see i i honestly i'd say i don't have answers for some of this stuff I mean, some of the guys, look, they were always assholes. They were always nuts, and you kind of knew it, and maybe there was a time when you, you would it make alliances. Cute. No, I mean, there was like there was a time when, look, this is what you have. Um, I've always just assumed that a lot of people in politics are are, are, are jerks and narcissists and whatever, and you, 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 make, you, you make accommodations. But then there are guys who you think of as, here's somebody I'm going to take his thoughts seriously his ideas seriously hmm. and then to watch him change um i don't think his principles have changed i think something's happened to him and it is that that process of watching people uh transform now again i'm, I'm sorry to dwell on dennis but for a lot of these people it's pretty obvious it's like they want to stay relevant they want to uh build their their brand and everything but dennis prager is not a young guy at some point He's got the kind of, I would have thought, philosophical basis that he would have thought, okay, I don't need to do this for clicks or whatever. I don't need this. I want to be concerned about how I'm remembered, what my contribution is, what my legacy is. So um, obviously that hasn't happened. So I, I no, don't know. No, but what if that he is concerned with that and this is the choice that he's made? Well, that's, see, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that is possible. And then I can't explain it. I can't explain it. how do you end up here saying these crazy ass things um if, if if in fact this is your choice what is going on with these people i mean you know i mean i i've, I've run through all the explanations are they pandering to the donors i mean one of the big stories that i think is underappreciated is the degree to which a handful of really powerful influential donors have you know kind of put their fingers on the scale and incentivized a lot of what's been going on but even so it, i don't know I don't know. It's it. So it's I, pain, it's I, painful I wanna, stuff. I I want to focus on the pain for yeah. a minute because I you and I both have people in our lives who yeah. there's a lot of pain about this, um, and I have two in particular who I honestly just don't. I don't want to name them because. We all um, know who they are, anyways. No, I'm just kidding. I have no, no idea. No, one of them about. you do, one of them you don't. But I, I don't, I don't want to. No, no, I don't want to pick fights and. No, um, let's not. But honestly, um, if you, I, I'm, there is a name I'm going to mention, which is Bill Crystal. So if you had told me that either of these two people, or Bill Crystal, yeah, was going to be a uh uh capable of saying completely crazy things we we're talking now 2015 right. 2016 right, right. and that one of them would behave like a political apparatchik 
and the other would behave like a a deeply principled person whom I would be willing to lie down in traffic for. Um, in neither of these cases would I have said, oh, uh, this is the crazy person. And yeah. right, I would have said, OK, Bill is a political guy. I mean, he worked for, right. you know, he was Dan Quayle's chief of staff. He started a Rupert Murdoch funded magazine. Right. Like I would have. Um, and, you know, and I've realized through this that my ability to predict who ends up being principled and who ends up being uh, some combination of crazy and craven, and it's not always obvious which we're talking about, but saying things that they are just way too smart to believe. Yeah. He says this um, about me all the time. We've been doing that they, uh, We're talking about Kate. <laughs> one, one of these people is Kate, of course. Uh, the other is Scott Shapiro. Um, yeah. uh, you, you know, my ability to predict that is so un, uneven, which is to say I would have gotten a few people right in both directions, but there's not better than a coin flip. And so my question to you is, looking back, do you see any pattern to it? Or is it like hard? Do, do you have e any co any more confidence in retrospect that you can separate the Dennis Pragers from the Bill Crystals or less confidence? Um, I have actually, less. A, 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 actually less. Um, I actually was out in. Uh, I love in that. Old... I love that. By the way, just love that loss of certainty. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. No. The better, I... Like the fa like the better you are at knowing that you're not certain about things. Like. Well, yeah. The outcomes. Well, well then I have a lot for you to like. Because <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, so I was out in at Occidental College uh, out in the L.A. area a couple of weeks ago giving the Jack Kemp Memorial Lecture, and somebody oh, yeah. said, "Well." You know, what would Jack Kemp think about all of this? And I started off by going, well, Jack Kemp would be horrified. And then I thought, no, I don't know that. You know, I mean, I don't know that he wouldn't have gotten drawn into this, this, this tribal world, the conservative ink. I just don't know. I would like to be able to say that. Um, but I mean, who would have, who would have guessed that, you know, Paul Ryan would be the guy who would basically go underground and become a board member of Fox, but then Mitt Romney and Liz Cheney would be standing up against Donald Trump. Who, I mean, did you have Liz Cheney in your, on your bingo card? Um, I don't, I don't know that I would have. Eh. Uh, no, no. <laughs> um, you know, there are other people. So, so no, I, I was actually looking at some pictures from a national review event a couple of years ago, and I'm standing with some people, um, including a couple of people who have become deeply, deeply deplorable. I mean, I don't mean just Trumpian. I mean, all right. And I'm sitting there drinking with them and chatting with them. No idea. Um, can't really explain it. I'm also standing next to some people who I think that you might have thought would have gone along with all of this, but as far as I know, haven't. So um, I, if there's a formula, if there's a pattern, I don't know what it is. You know, I, 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 I've toyed with it a couple of times, trying to think through um, and and I, I probably should edit some of this, but I think people who are were a little bit more grounded, who had a little bit more personal self confidence, were less likely to get drawn into that. Um, but uh, you know, and 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 I think there's also this pattern of many of the neocons who used to be liberal Democrats who became conservatives during the Reagan era. Um, hmm. who sort of remembered that tradition or who have an historic memory of things that happened earlier in the last century um, have been more, you know, uh, more skeptical of it. Uh, but that's the only pattern that I can discern. I mean, I live, I live in Wisconsin here. Okay. Um, a few years ago when I actually had dark hair, um, every Republican in this state was anti-Trump. Every single one of them um, understood exactly, you know, where they thought the party should go. And as I'm sitting here right now, every single one of them, with maybe one exception, has just completely gone over. And it's the the smart ones and the dumb ones, the ones who I thought were interested in public policy and the guys who were complete demagogues, and they've all ended up in the same place. Can I... Go ahead, Kate. Yeah. So we had... 
um, you're familiar, you're familiar with kind of the concept, at least of Bayesian reasoning, kind of like the idea that you have a prior association or a prior held belief, and then you get facts right. that you call. And this is like one of the, I think this is like, the, it is the dominant mode of thought among cognitive psychologists, cognitive scientists, that this is how we reason. Um, and so like the idea that you have a prior set of beliefs and how many sets of facts do you have to have to the counterfactual that chop cause you to <laughs> yeah. move yeah. your prior from one place to another. Oh. And I mentioned this specifically, I might be primed for this, not to mention another cognitive science phenomenon, but like I might be primed for this because we had a cognitive science on, scientist on the show yesterday. But I do actually think that what you're describing um, is a very interesting kind of overlay between the idea that we actually don't reason through people. Right. Like, or we don't reason about our beliefs about people until something very dramatic changes. So I'll give you a non-political example. So Ben just shared, and you have obviously very strong feelings about some people who've changed belief, but I'll give you a couple that I don't have like any, I've never met them. Like I don't really, that are academic, but also slightly political in their own way, but not my politics. Noam Chomsky and Alan Dershowitz. Let's just like name some random, like, okay, so I know this might sound really weird to you, but if you look at Noam Chomsky's early work, he started off as this brilliant cognitive scientist at MIT. He did all of this work in kind of like moral grammar and the idea of how an ethics, as you say, like kind of like a Prager type, like just a brilliant scientist. Yeah became obsessed with kind of like Palestinian politics. And like, I, won't, I don't want to say like, yeah. kind of went off the deep end, but like, if you look at like the person that is in the writings of Noam Chomsky on moral grammar, and you look at 30 years later, they're just like, yeah. not even recognizable as the same person. And I have always been like, how do I reconcile these two people? Alan Dershowitz is like another type of example. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, you could name a lot of like, I think we chalk up creative types to creativeness or to mental illness or to like other types of things. You could chalk up a lot of creative types to this type of phenomenon of like kind of like having this one thing that they stood for and then like going and doing something completely insane, like being a reality TV star and then thinking you can be president. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, anyways, all of this is to say is like, is this just because we're bad at thinking about people or do you guys really take this personally? Well, I think I'm 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 bad in, in thinking about people. Um, you know, it's uh, obviously I I don't have I don't have the handle on all of this, you know. But you know, you're talking about you know you know reasoning. I mean, look, I the the conversation that I've had, and I I, I try to think back historically how it happened with some of these these people, and and I do understand. This is something I actually do have a little bit of insight into, is that. The one thing that really drives a lot of politics are the people that we loathe, the people that we hate, um, the negative partisanship. So my conversations will go, I, I can spend half an hour sitting with, with somebody talking about what's going on, and we will not disagree at all about Donald Trump or, or what's been happening in American politics at all. And then there's a point where they go, yeah, but you know what? I just hate the Democrats more. I just hate, and then run through some names or some things. And in a state like Wisconsin, things had become so bitter, had become so nasty. So many personal relationships had been destroyed that, that it became inconceivable that Republicans here would ally themselves with Democrats. And by the way, Democrats have no interest in allying themselves, even with never Trumpers here in Wisconsin. And I think that sometimes those personal uh, judgments cloud it so that, you know, you may think it's about ideas, you may think it's about principles, but they're so thin. It's sort of like, okay, so when everybody talked about fiscal conservatism and being concerned about the debt and the deficit, well, well, was that was that really just about sort of like, this is what my team, this is what's being served by my team today. So this is what I'm eating at the buffet. But if I have to eat something else, then I'm completely okay as long as I can stay at the buffet, as long as I can stay with these people because I cannot see being with the other side because I hate them so much. And that's... Um, okay, but, you know. but so I totally agree with this, that a huge amount of this is ultimately about definition of team. Oh, yeah. But 
I that that but is... isn't principles about judging picking the buffet by what the fuck is in the buffet and not just about who's standing you would around think well, so. But, you but the, but, there but is the flaw it, as an initial yeah. matter, <laughs> right? So as an initial matter, you pick buffet number yeah. one because you're pro life right. because right. you believe in lower taxes, yeah. less right. government, right. and a and a kind of more uh, muscular foreign policy. Yeah. But then what you find is that everybody around buffet one really hates the people around buffet two. And the definition of buffet one becomes the hatred of buffet two, which actually has almost nothing to do with any of those ideas. It's simply a tribal identity. And so my question is, and I, I'm really interested in the question of how to get people who are organized around that hatred, particularly on the conservative side, because that's where I think yeah. the danger is right now, but yeah. also, frankly, on the liberal side, because there are, there are a lot of liberals who will not entertain what I think of, of as valuable and important ideas because the the people who represent those ideas are hated around table number two, buffet number two. I think it's a lesser problem right now, but I'm interested in the question of how you get people to entertain ideas from the wrong table. And so if, if people around buffet number one are saying, you know, gosh, you know, this... I'm really not interested in this Josh Mandel stuff and this uh, there's a lot of crazy going on, but I, I really hate the table number two stuff. How do you get them to focus on that first part rather than the second part? OK, let me tweak this a little bit because, OK, so table one hates table two, but having spent so much time at table one, I also have to tell you that one of the driving factors is knowing that the people at table two hate you. They really loathe you. They look down on you. They look at you with this contempt is so and disdain. Important. This is the thing. It's like the, the leading to the, you know, the, the fact that we, you know, the, the negative partisanship is the sense that the other side just thinks you are the worst person on earth. Now, I have to tell you that before the Trump thing came along, um, I, I could run through, we could spend the next hour telling you what people on the left used to say about me and many still do on social media. And after a certain point, I, I remember thinking, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of being on this one team. You know, wouldn't it be great to be able to have conversations with people on the other team? But then it would always end with, but they hate you too much to talk to you. And so this is the other thing is there's no out. You know, you may hate the buffet. You may have come there because you thought it was was better. And now the, the chicken is, you know, going bad and, you know, and the, and the lettuce is all wilted and everything. But you can't move. So the, the that's part of the problem that and, and, you know, I mean, the simple way is as the Bolshevik and the and the Stalinist who just returned from the camps at, in the last episode of the French village yeah. says, <laughs> Uh, why he can't leave the party even after being in a Stalinist camp and watching people be shot in the back of the head. My my home may be rotten, but it's the only home I've got. Well, there's a lot of that. I mean, there is a lot of that. And I guess, you know, part of it is, is that you can't have a discussion that begins, hey, by the way, I, I think you're an ignorant bigot and your mother's ugly. Would you like to hear my ideas about taxes? I mean, it just doesn't go anywhere, you know? <laughs> you know, and, and, and a lot of the conversations kind of feel that way. So um, and, and, I, and I think I was I was watching this after after Vir Virginia and it was this drumbeat that the voters there must be, you know, really, you know, they're all a bunch of white supremacists and white racists and everything like that. Um, why won't they listen to us? Why won't they make common cause? Well, wait, these were people that voted for you. A year ago, there were people that voted for Barack Obama, you know, maybe maybe twice. Um, but, you know, con I think it's Arthur Brooks who really talks about you know, the, the dangers of contempt. You know, that moment in which the, somebody thinks that the other person regards them with contempt or rolls their eyes, then the conversation's over. Then so can I 
I yeah. love this point again because this is like empirically proven that you can't change minds. But like the main way that you change minds is by talking to people directly and not right. expressing contempt for them. Um, and so this is actually super interesting because one of the things that I hate the most about politics is that it uses this mechanism of outrage, this like, well, this high, let's say like you just put all, all brownies in your fucking buffet and then like everyone wants to come to your buffet because that's this metaphor is getting fucking stomped yeah. on by the way like yeah. we yeah. have driven this into the ground and if yeah. past sunstein he was here he'd be like you put broccoli first to nudge people to put more broccoli on their plate and so then anyways but um that's the problem is democrats think people want broccoli yeah, no, they don't. Everyone, yeah, no, they, no one no, likes they, broccoli. They don't. No, Democrats no. and Republicans don't yes. think that anyone likes broccoli. They just think you should have it. And then no. I think I should be able to tell you, no, I don't want it. And the, <laughs> that entire, like, balance. Yeah. Anyway, but the idea is basically, like, I do really think that some one of the things that you're, like, and we started this with me joking about how you make your living in politics and how I could never do this. But one of the reasons is because I find it to be like so utterly like dis like the the outrage and the the hatred and the vitriol the normative like right. takeaways from people's views are like stifling to free expression and like and free thought and like kind of coming to because no one's going to reach a point of like everyone's going to be very certain if it's like Hitler or you or right. like or like or it's you know it's like these are like the choices. Um, and so yeah, that's, and that's kind up. of what it sets up, right? Like, yeah. it's not like right now I can even, and this is not just, sorry, I have like this stupid fly flying around. Um, but there's like, it's not even like, it's just Republicans and Democrats. I do tech policy and tech research. I can't talk to Facebook right now or like talk about working with Facebook or talk about, I feel like talking, having sources inside Facebook because like literally having any type of affiliation is so toxic that you just get like shouted right. out of a room. Huh. And so it's like, it's stifling to kind of like finding truth and coming to rational consensus. And one of the things that I think the bulwark and you and others have talked about is like that that's kind of how you're feeling now. But I'm just really curious yeah. what drove you to politics in the first place. Well, by the way, just I mean, th this is the, the the one bit of good news is that this new period does feel liberating because you 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 can indulge in this, which was not permitted before. Um, and actually, I just finished doing a, um, a a webinar with with David French, and we were talking about some of these same things. And 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 you're right, but one of the worst things about the media right now is it doesn't do nuance very well. You you can't you know you know for for example you know everybody wants you know the red meat on the Kyle Rittenhouse case you know for to say hey two things can be true at the same time that it's terrible that this kid was there um, you know a grotesquely irresponsible parenting um, extremely bad judgment bad behavior on the other hand he's go probably going to be acquitted because it was self defense I mean that kind of nuanced thing is going to get you killed so what drew me to politics I mean I got I got involved in politics when I was a I was a teenager my my, my actually almost a preteen. You know, my, my dad was Eugene McCarthy's campaign manager back in 1968, the anti-war campaign. Um, I actually, in 1968, I flew around in the campaign plane with Eugene McCarthy. Um, you know, so I, I got I, I got that early baptism. And I just thought it was fascinating. I think it was interesting. I thought it was consequential. Um, I, I, I believed in, you know, many of the things that we were talking about. I mean, I believe, you know, was very, very idealistic. Um, over time and spending time in journalism, I've become less idealistic and more cynical. Um, but I never. What would Eugene McCarthy say about right now? Speaking well, see, of this, is what's never, let, uh, never mind Jack Kent. He didn't okay. die that long ago. I okay, actually. let me let me tell you. Th this is what has ruined me. Um, this is where I got spoiled. You know, because 1968 was sort of the center of my my universe. Um, being around candidates that used to be intelligent and eloquent, Eugene McCarthy wrote poetry. You know, part of it is, is that, is that I, I got into politics at a time when we had some pretty impressive figures who represented what, what American politics could be, even the ones you disagreed with. And to now watch the, this incredible sort of mind, soul crushing stupidity 
that you're, you know, that, that you see them when, with, you know, political leaders, you know, chanting, let's go Brandon and stuff like that. It's not, not that it's just offensive. It's just, it's just so dumb. And so that's, that's one of the most, for me, that that's actually one of oh, the most, I, I, I got to cut right. you off. I got to, I got to cut you off to foot stomp this point. You know, there is a time when U.S. political leaders, the average U member right. of the Senate, the average Senate speech was an intelligent argument. And when, when somebody would say, uh, you know, would the member yield for a question? There was actually right. a question, right? And that a Actual debate question. on the Senate floor yeah. meant a debate. And that was not that long ago. Um, the question of what destroyed it, what whether the role, That's whether it was C-SPAN no or Newt Gingrich or, um, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. But if you look at senatorial debates from as recently as the, you know, mid-1970s, there's a lot going on in terms of intellectual firepower, yeah. genuine argument. And, you know, this point that that we have regressed quite apart from whether you agree with the politics, you disagree with the politics to more stupid is is so true and so interesting. I really want to hear Charlie's. Sorry, go ahead, Charlie. No, I mean it, it, it's it's almost like it, it's it's not even bumper sticker thought. It is it is as if they have become addicted to sort of this mad like nana nana trolling. boo boo thought. No, actually, it is that I was actually thinking about that. It is at that level of you know nine year olds taunting each other on the playground, and you know remind me, um, where did where, where did uh, Ted Cruz go to college? Where did you know Josh Holly go to college? These guys are highly educated, and yet either because they think their voters are so stupid or because th this is just now, this is the coin of the realm. This is, this is what you have to do to get attention. And it's all about attention. But again, I, there was a time, I mean, you think about that. We once had Daniel Patrick Moynihan in the United States Senate willing to talk about ideas and question things and change his mind. Eugene McCarthy, Okay, so Hubert Humphrey maybe wasn't the greatest intellectual, but I mean, these are good, fundamentally decent I actually human thought Bernie beings. Sanders was like a decent, like independent, and like I always liked, I don't know what well, anyways, but like I, I yeah. like you might disagree with that, but like I, I mean, I don't know. But yeah. Bernie Sanders is reading off of a script. I now. Know, now, Daniel he is, Patrick now he is, but like there was Daniel a Patrick Moynihan was a, was a significant essayist. Yeah. He was the one analyst who predicted the fall of the Soviet Union. Well, and remember, James Buckley was a United States senator as a Republican. It was, you know, on, um, you know, both both political parties. And now it is this juvenile um, sloganeering. Trump, look, didn't invent this. He may not be popularized it. But have you noticed how it just the the it would be interesting just to to, to do an analysis of the use of language over the last several years, you know, mm. at one time they spoke at a 12th grade level, then they were at an eighth grade level. And now it feels like it's like a trending toward a fourth grade level. I mean, they're arguing I about this Big Bird and Mr. Potato Head. So I mean, I, I've going seen, south I, of fourth I, grade. Yeah. This analysis has been done, uh, not with respect to Senate rhetoric, but with respect to presidential rhetoric. Yeah. Um, it was uh, a book that I came across uh, in, um, the course of researching uh, uh, with Susan Hennessy, our book on the Trump presidency. Uh, it is by a uh, professor in Singapore about presidential mm. rhetoric and the, the number of words they're using. Uh, it is exactly what you would expect. It, it stops before Trump, and but the complexity of sentence structure is declining. I mean, it's exactly what you would predict. Yeah. Can I, I, I just want to say that there is like there is kind of a a perfect kind of point to what you're talking about, which is the idea that majoritarian rule or kind of like pandering to 
um, to a base majority and not to an elite. Like these are like these are some basic kind of problems with that kind of draw out the fact that like you say things like they went to a great school, they should know better. But like that doesn't end up mattering if we kind of serve up the same type of of if we serve up a reward for them that is the same as it was for Eugene McCarthy as it is for Ted Cruz. Right. Uh, right. Why make like, an argument? I mean, yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Why make an argument? And so like now you're just seeing that what wins like happens. And this is actually something that I think yeah. has kind of, to a certain extent, always been the case is like, they have done, like they've done it in different ways. There was like, people like us that listen to those like high-minded speeches and then i think that there were always people that were majority swayed by like people like joseph mccarthy like and people like that spoke to a to a to a level of outrage and anger and kind of absolute um absolute terms that were very easily consumable i don't know that that's entirely new well, um, it's 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 not and in fact i i, I thought it was very interesting going back and reading some uh some Hannah Arendt, where she talks about the language of of yeah. the, and I, I I'm always hesitant to go back to the 1930s to play that card, but she she talks about the these mass movements and and the role of language and and how the language was dumbed down and it was made simpler, you know, and it was more and and you kind of realize that there's kind of this reptilian understanding that maybe if you you know strip out all of the nuance and all of the all of the intelligence from it that you you tap into something visceral um because i mean let's be honest about it i mean obviously at some level this works i mean ted cruz does this because he, and i'm now quoting dana milbank from my podcast today look attention and celebrity is the new power i mean it used mm. to be that you'd have to have like ideas or legislation that's how you got to power now you get attention you are outrageous on Twitter, and then you get featured on Fox News, and that is, and that kind of, you know, bogus celebrity is now power in the Republican Party. And, and so that's why, why it all starts with way? dog shirts. Yes. <laughs> Wait, how? What? I, I so like. I mean, you know, like, it's about attention oh. and celebrity, and so we're it, starting with dog shirts. dog shirts. We're going to build a political movement based on the celebrity associated and the outrageousness associated with dog shirts. But isn't this one of the dangers, not to get back to also like a, like a really a founder's point, isn't yeah. this one of the dangers of having ju like this meant like this kind of movement of like celebrating RBG, like as like kind of like, or Ruth Bader Ginsburg as kind of this like canoned like in like person giving honorary like honorifics to like forever to presidents like like very like to, so like to, to treat that to treat like the like i i would say that obama and clinton were among the worst but the bushes certainly can't be excluded from this like that there that there is like no one went back to their peanut farm like we wish jimmy carter had done in the first place um but there was like i mean I think that like post 1980, you just never see that again. I don't think we're going to ever see it again. I think that there has become like post Reagan, you're just never going to have a president that is like either going to come from nothing uh, and leave and like go or ever go back to kind of anonymity. Well, okay. I don't even know what, what, what the future of the presidency looks like. I mean, the thing about Donald Trump is he just upended any understanding of what you needed to do to be president. You know, I mean, I know people will say, well, Ronald Reagan was an actor. Well, he was also a two term governor of the state of California. He had some experience. But with Donald Trump, anybody can become president, right? You know, you said the reality TV show host who thinks he'd become president. He did become president. So every reality TV show host is thinking Howard Stern's running for president now. I actually think this is why a not great me? move, by the way. No, no, no. Like, like why not Howard Stern? Because I why think not? it makes all of it seem so absurdist. It actually kind of like calls it out. It like makes it like a race it, among it, idiots. Except for the possibility, you know, except for the possibility <laughs> that it's not calling it out. Okay, Eric Berg, I'm having trouble bringing your image on screen, but you should be audible, and the floor is yours. Oh, there you are. Oh, Hi, there Eric. you are. 
All right. Uh, so there's a movement in Idaho uh, for Democrats to register as Republicans because we've got a closed primary to fight against extreme GOP candidates in the primary. Have you just, seen just this for, BS? Just, just for context, Charlie, Eric is the uh, uh, is a Democratic county chair in in Idaho. Okay. And a and a bulwark plus sur subscriber. So I I don't know if I'm the only Democratic Party official, but I doubt it. But um, you send me stuff about Idaho, don't you? Once in a while. Okay. Okay. Probably. Right, right. <laughs> uh, I don't get a lot of Idaho stuff. So. Yeah. Well, there's not a whole lot of us out here. Anyway, have you seen <laughs> that be a, a successful strategy anywhere? I don't uh, know that I've ever seen it be a successful strategy. It's always talked about. Um, you know, going into the other party's primary. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you about Idaho politics, but the prospects of Democrats being winning statewide, I think, are probably limited. So um, maybe you could help the Republican Party in Idaho from going completely insane, because I do think that there's a real price to be paid for having a completely insane Republican Party. And I got to tell you, I, it's going to get much, much worse. Um, whatever happens after 2022 and 2024, the Republican Party is going to be way more deplorable than it is right now. Um, and, and so anything that anyone can do to keep one of our two major political parties from completely, well, it has completely lost its mind, but um, going even further is, is positive. I mean, I'll be honest with you. If I was in, in Idaho, I, I probably would be voting for the least crazy Republican candidate in the primary just as a self-defense mechanism. Susan Brewer, the floor is yours. Hey, um, Charlie, please tell you and your other um, bulwark people that not all Democrats hate you. <laughs> I mean, I want to tell you. Um, so you guys are funny. You care about the issues. You care about each other. And you're focused on um, the threat of to the democracy. Democracy. Uh, I love listening uh, because I can. It, it allows me to step outside the political framework and d try to do some analysis, and that's valuable. So just go ahead and well, say, thank you. Thank yeah, you. yeah. So the work that y'all do is incredibly important. Well, thank you, and, and we'll keep doing it. You know, yeah. um, you know, and and that's. And because um, the, the the threat has obviously not gone away. It, yeah, yeah. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at Tom McGuckin flashing on screen for five seconds, yet making time to hold up his <laughs> bottle of whiskey or tequila or whatever it is that he's drinking. Sorry, Susan. <laughs> am I? Am I? Can I be heard now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I see just... Ben's lips moving and nothing coming out. But okay. So, um, Charlie, I really enjoy listening to. Um, to the podcast. I, um, uh, I, I'm a long time ex Republican. I just I left about 20 years ago. Um, and part of it was just because I found a lot of things that I couldn't trust anymore that I had been hearing. And so that, that I had a lot to do with my changing my position. So I kind of wanted to compare notes and to see, um, what, um, what sorts of things have changed in your thinking since you, you know, I realized that and anyone who spends a lot of time in a party knows that it's you know, there is some degree of groupthink that you try to resist, but you also get caught into. I'm wondering what's your experience and what uh, some of your views that may have changed since you've gotten um, a, away from that, you know, that sort of bubble. Well, as I said earlier, I mean, one of the nice things about being out of the bubble is you can rethink all of these things. And I think the biggest thing is to realize how many things I thought I really cared about that I don't really care about that much. Kind of like change what? the focus of, well, you know, I mean, things like, you know, government budgets and things like that, you know, the the, the realization yeah, that well, the, the realization that so much of the Republican focus has been on cutting government spending as opposed to being concerned with 
what is happening in the real world? Are there problems that need to be dealt with and solved? As opposed to what can we do to make it harder for public employees? What can we do to make it more difficult for you know people who are receiving, you know, receiving government benefits? A lot of it was very very punitive, and there was a real disconnect. I think so. I'm willing to rethink. See, I actually, you know, part of the the disillusionment is to realize I was allied with people that I didn't understand. And, and who claimed to have a set of principles that were obviously very lightly held. So if they can rethink their principles, can I rethink mine? So for example, I think five, six years ago, I would have been horrified by the infrastructure bill because I think all of these omnibus, cromnibus bills are gigantic shit sandwiches, which they, they are. Um, but now I think, you know what? It doesn't bother me that we're spending a lot of money on roads and bridges and trains and even rural broadband. I am not that offended by these things anymore. And if, in fact, it will put people back to work, you know, that's good. I'm still concerned. I'm very concerned about inflation. I'm really concerned at some point with that we have to get some control on the debt. Um, but one of the things that I think I've, you know, I, I think the, you know, pre-Trump, I don't think I ever saw a tax cut that I didn't like, but now I'm looking at, at the situation and going, why should we have billionaires like Donald Trump who pay little or nothing in taxes? And, and why, by the way, are Democrats so politically inept that they are not pounding that issue every freaking day? Can I, I Tom McGuckin is gonna come on in a second. He's the economist, but I will say just for one second that maybe this is naive of me, but I always saw the Republican emphasis on small government and small government spending to both be about like a sense of racism and like and like an inability to kind of like not help your fellow man, but also either as pretext or as a, a totally distinct, firmly held belief about like kind of liberty over like being able to spend your money how you wanted to spend it and help people how you wanted to help them. And it was like, a liberty issue either balanced in that or legitimately held in that and like tom is like yeah fuck that shit that was always about racism but like go ahead tom, oh. <laughs> tom mcguckin, the floor, tom mcguckin uh, the floor is yours charlie uh, you can hear me okay everybody yes. Yes. i'm a badger okay but for clarification with kate i'm really a hen okay uh mm. a hen that is the pomona hens out in california before oh, yeah. i became a badger at any rate, listen, um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, global warming. At least you're not warming. a main black fly. What's that? I said, at least you're not a main black fly. Yeah. <laughs> At any rate, so back to uh, global warming. Uh, and by the way, Wisconsin has a lot of those farting cows. Okay, I know all about those guys. Um, or ladies, whatever you want to call them. The um, thing Biden did lately, very recently, was he may have come up with a real hardcore methane regulation on oil and gas wells, which is a big source of global warming. Now, if Trump or a Republican gets back in in 24, they'll just reverse it, okay? In other words, so they'll have a regulation in the EPA or something like yeah, that, yeah. and then they get reversed. So in your sort of view of things, how do you make it more sort of... It, swapping in uh, administration proof. In other words, just because one administration comes in and reverses it, because global warming takes more than two years of regulation to fix, okay? Uh, so I'm just wondering, do you have any ideas about that? Well, you have to put it into law. I mean, it's much more difficult to repeal a law, but you, there's no question about it. I mean, I, I think one of the most disturbing things we're seeing is, and again, this is not new, it's not breaking news, but the 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 anti-science drift of the Republican Party has accelerated exponentially with this whole vaccine coronavirus uh, issue. And so if you think that this is bad right now, wait till you see when they apply it to global warming. I mean, this is going to be a litmus test for Republicans. So however bad you think it is, it's going to get worse. OK, so could you just talk among yourselves for a moment, because I need to actually plug this in. I wasn't planning on using this computer. So you may hear I need to step away and you may hear lots of very loud dogs. We're Will going to you be, be able very to hear excited. us? The, the moment that I move, 
See, my All dogs right. are like radar. We're okay. We're going to okay. mute All you. Right. So I will but... be. I will be back. All right. So we're not going to pose uh, uh, Mike, Godwin's Mike Godwin's question, question. yet because uh, he can't we're hear an us. Echo. You hear an echo? Yes, I did briefly. Mike's muted now, so now I don't hear the echo. So, all right, we're just going to let Mike Godwin talk until Charlie gets back. Mike Godwin, the floor is yours, but don't pose your question. He's, oh, he's muted. There you go. There you go. Uh, so, I, I was I, I mentioned in the chat that there's this story. I think I must have read it in like Reader's Digest when I was 12, uh, but about a, a classroom of a psychology lecture class in which the students as an experiment started smiling whenever the professor approached the left side of the lecture hall and frowning when they approached the, the, the right side of the they lecture hall. They made a Skinner hall. box. Skinner box. And they basically turned the lecture hall into a Skinner box that conditioned the professor's behavior so that they were like trying to get him to actually leave the lecture hall by moving out the door in the direction of the smiles. And so I, to bring it to the question, uh, as soon as Charlie's back. Uh, yeah, wait, wait on the question because Charlie doesn't have his his earpiece in, uh, so he can't hear us. Uh, which means uh, that you posing the question now will do no good. Are you back, Charlie? I am. Sorry about that. All right, Mike Godwin, your question. My question is: Don't we think that uh, you know you see this with uh, actors and comedians sometimes, where they just respond to whatever they they exaggerate the shtick depending on the audience applause and i can't help but think that with someone like prager or with uh some, some certainly with many of our political figures there's a kind of an unconscious conditioning thing that happens because they get so much positive reinforcement when they act more in, in more and more extreme ways and they may not i, I mean I, I don't think they're morally uh, i think they're morally culpable regardless but it seems like some of them are unconscious in many respects about how they're being driven into more extreme positions or, or being lured into more extreme positions based on, you know, whatever's red meat for, you know, their feedback mechanisms. So that's so, my. Yeah, no, that's a great question because it's kind of a chicken or egg thing, because I think a lot of people in uh, in politics and right wing media are driven by the audience. Um, they're not leaders. What they're doing is they're responding to the audience that the audience wants the red meat, the, audi the audience wants those dopamine hits. And so um, it goes back and forth, uh, you know, whether or not, it, and, the, and this, is the, this is the incentive structure. Um, and right now, if you don't give people what they want, say on conservative talk radio, um, you will get blasted by them because they want conservative talk radio to, you know, you know, give them the dopamine hits uh, to confirm their priors, uh, to be a safe space. And so they are responding to all this. But, you know, when you're a grown up like Dennis Prager, I mean, honestly, I mean, do these people have any, I guess I keep asking this guy, don't you have any pride? I mean, don't, don't you look at yourself in the mirror and go, okay, so I, I got 500,000 Twitter followers. Hey, my life is now has meaning because I've put out this crazy stuff. Uh, but but you're right. I think they are, um, you, you know, as, as this process of the invasion of the body snatchers watching people, they are responding to the celebrity. They are responding to the positive feedback. And unfortunately, all the celebrity and the positive feedback goes to the people who are the, you know, most reckless and the most extreme. And that's not going to get any better anytime soon. I would just say that, like, this is the exact thing that everyone is hit at, like, that you're talking about with journalism and, like, talk radio and everything else is the exact kind of same operating conditioning mechanism that Mike is describing for social media. Like, social media right. gets the yeah. same. same like, but, but, like, no one's talking about the fact that, like, everyone has this type of, like, conditioning mechanism. So, anyways, but, yeah. Mike. Mike Nelson. Good to be Follow back. You. Uh, here's two yes, no questions. Cause we don't have a lot of time and I'm going to combine two of them in the chat. Um, Liz Cheney is going to New Hampshire now, and I'm wondering if you'll be sending her a campaign contribution. And on the other side, is there anything Kevin McCarthy can do, particularly with regard to representative, uh, Gosar that would lead you to send him 
a campaign contribution because that's another form of stimulus that can perhaps push people in the right direction. Yeah, I, well, I, I, I'm not writing out checks to uh, to politicians these days, um, but but I certainly want to give some attaboys to Liz Cheney. Um, you know what she's doing. That woman is amazing to me. That speech she gave the other night, if you haven't listened to it, um, I mean, it is pure fire. And 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 she understands the existential threat that the country faces in a way that even some Democrats don't. So I have tremendous admiration for her. Um, but it does seem to come as a surprise to people to find out that she's still a conservative Republican. I, I kind of got into a little bit of a back and forth with a guy that I really admire. I mean, I think Mehdi Hassan is like the smartest guy on, on cable television. And so this is not personal, but he was taking shots at her. But Liz Cheney voted against infrastructure, as in don't fall in love with her. Really don't take her, you know, don't don't regard her as an important ally. And I, I thought that was unfortunate. Because if, if you do regard this attack on democracy as an existential threat, then you are going to understand you will disagree about infrastructure, but on the issues that really matter, you're on the same side. Uh, as far as Kevin McCarthy, look, um, Kevin McCarthy is never going to do anything about Paul Gosar. Um, he is all in on all of this. I mean, maybe it started with fear um, and later it became simply a habit to go along with this. And at a certain point, it becomes endorsement and you know, by next year, it'll be hell. Yeah. Kill AOC. Uh, Kevin, Kevin McCarthy has told us who he is over and over again, and there's nothing he could do. Well, just one more comment on this. I was on a cable show yesterday where somebody said, well, you know, the, the house, uh, house Republicans are now this, uh, racist, uh, party that, uh, advocates violence. And my reaction was, if you're the leader of that party, you could refute that by taking action against Paul Gosar. But Kevin McCarthy will never take that action. You know, it's it's not that long ago that healthy political parties engaged in political hygiene. A healthy political party would not tolerate a Paul Gosar. And you know, a healthy political culture would not tolerate a political Gosar. But what does it say that absolutely nothing is going to be done? That Liz Cheney is a pariah where Paul Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert and Madison Cawthorn and Matt Gates are members in good standing of the House Republican Conference and will be forever. What does that say? You think forever? Sorry. Well, really? Forever? No, like, well, no certainty. Okay. No certainty. For no the foreseeable future. Okay, so... <laughs> If we're talking about forever, I mean, you know, the, the sun will go dark and we'll all be no, dead. I know, but, uh, but you like, know what I mean. You think the next twenty years? You'd say no. The next I don't. I, no, I, I just mean for the next the next few cycles that there's no, you know, in in the McCarthy era, there's they're never going to do anything about them. Fair enough. Christopher Argerus, you get the last question today. All right, Charlie. So is the Aaron Rodgers uh, story saga is is that playing differently in Wisconsin than it is for the Coastal elites or transatlantic elites, if you want to call myself. Well, uh, yeah, it is because he's bigger here. I mean, you know, we we live, you know, in 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 Packer land, and I think that there was a really a lot of disgust, um, not just about what he had to say, but understand that that in that in Packer land, the fact that he endangered the Packer team, the fact that he, um, uh, you, you know, you know, put the the entire playoff run in in jeopardy. That may not be the most important thing about it, but the reality is, it, his selfishness, his narcissism, and his conspiracy crack pottery um, actually um, endangered his teammates. And I think that there had been a little bit of you know skepticism about him, you know, after his holdout, whether he was going to come back to the team. Um, but he's not, um, uh, you know, he. He is he is not the golden boy that he he would have been. And so in terms of politics, uh, Senator Ron Johnson put out a, a tweet saying, you know, you go, Aaron. Aaron is, you know, has every right to speak out about all of this. And I thought it was a little bit political tone, politically tone deaf, because however you feel about the coronavirus, if you screw with the Packers, uh, the Packers, a regular season record and their playoff run, uh, that's dangerous stuff here. We are going to leave it there. Charlie Sykes, you're a great American. Okay. It's great to see your face. Am I going to see you this weekend? Now, what's this weekend? Oh, no. Oh. You're not going to be there? You know, no, I'm not. Charlie and I are both yeah. members of a secret society yeah. that is having a meeting this weekend. 
Um, but uh, uh, we will see you soon, however. Um, no, it's, it's a secret society. You're muted, Kate. <laughs> no, I'm not muted. I'm just, oh, I'm just you're like just mouthing mumbling. words. <laughs> yeah. Um, we will be back tomorrow. I have no idea who the guest is going to be. Uh, but lovely. Thanks for such a great conversation, Charlie. This yeah. Great. Right, As you. always. Great to see you. Right. We have no idea who the guest it'll be, but it'll be exactly 23 hours from now. And until then, Kate. We can't have fun anymore. Um, but we can have buffets. That's right. Yeah, and we can but really no hate the team at we the other buffet. We can hate the people that we're standing at next to <laughs> as much as the broccoli. <laughs> See you tomorrow.